This week, a long-awaited letter is on its way. A new investigation is underway at the Vatican, and we look at the powerful Holy Week homilies of Pope Francis. Hello and welcome to another edition of Vatican Connections. Now, of course, Pope Francis is taking a bit of a break right now after the Holy Week Tritium, and we are going to take a look at all of the homilies and the powerful message that was delivered during those liturgies. But first, the much-awaited papal exhortation about the family will be released April 8th. The document will be called Amores Letizie, or The Joy of Love on Love in the Family. Now, what do we know about the content of the document? Well, back in February, while flying from Mexico to Rome, Pope Francis told reporters the document will summarize all that the Synod said, including about broken families, the importance of serious marriage preparation programs, raising and educating children, and integrating divorced and civilly remarried Catholics into active parish life, even if they cannot receive communion. And he was very adamant that integration into the life of the church does not mean receiving communion. Now, the exhortation will be presented at the Vatican April 8th with a press conference. Cardinal Lorenzo Baldesseri, who heads up the Synod of Bishops, as well as Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn, and a married couple that runs the Family Ministry Office of the Archdiocese of Milan will be part of that presser, and we will have full details on the exhortation as soon as it's released. The Vatican will open its archives on Argentina between the years of 1976 and 1983. Now that period corresponds to the Dirty War era during which people were disappearing for opposing the government in the country. That period also corresponds to the time the late Cardinal Pio Laghi was nuncio to Argentina. When he was still alive, Laghi was accused of being complicit with the military regime and was sued by family members of people who disappeared. During the Dirty War period, Pope Francis was the Jesuit provincial and his actions have also been criticized. The hope is that opening these archives will shed light on how the church in Argentina interacted with the military government. The documents related to that period are currently being catalogued at the Vatican, and that process should be finished in a few months. Now, the bishops of Argentina are also working on their own archives from that period, and they started working on that back in 2012. Now, you may have heard of a little girl from the U.S. who was scheduled to meet Pope Francis this week. Lizzie Myers has a rare disease that will take her vision. And at the top of her visual bucket list, that is the things and people to see before her vision goes, was Pope Francis in Rome. Everything was set. She and her parents were supposed to be at this week's general audience for her meet and greet with the Pope. However, the family's flight was delayed and they missed their connection to Rome. The Myers arrived in Rome Wednesday evening, long after the end of the audience. Now, Vatican officials told Crux News that they would probably find a way to have her meet the Pope anyways. Turning to the Arabian Peninsula, there is still no word on the fate of Salesian Father Tom Uzhunulil, who was kidnapped by militants in Yemen on March 4th. A lot of information has been circulating on the internet about his presumed fate. You may have seen posts on social media claiming the priest had been crucified on Good Friday. However, according to Bishop Paul Hinder, who is in charge of the Vicariate of Southern Arabia, he told Catholic News Service there is no evidence to support these rumors. According to the Salesian Information Agency, there are still strong indications that Father Uzhunlil is still alive. India's Ministry of Foreign Affairs is working through diplomatic channels to secure his release. The Vatican is investigating how the remodeling of Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone's apartment was financed. 
So the Cardinal himself is not under investigation. Instead, two people, the former president and treasurer of the Bambino Gesù Hospital, are being investigated. The former president, Giuseppe Profitti, and treasurer Massimo Spina resigned in 2015 amid rumors that money from the foundation that supports the hospital was used to finance the renovation of Cardinal Bertone's apartment. The Cardinal has repeatedly disputed reports about the size and cost of his apartment, and he has said that he personally paid for the renovation. So we'll keep our eyes on that. And on a different note, the bishops of Canada have released their response to the government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations. Now, the final recommendations of the commission called on faith communities to repudiate what's called the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius. Both of these gave European colonizers power over newly discovered lands and regulated how they could interact with the people who they found living there. The Canadian bishop's response also includes promoting better awareness of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now, Bishop Donald Bolin of Saskatoon is the head of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops Justice and Peace Commission. Asked about the process of putting together the bishop's response, here's what he had to say. Well, I think, uh, like all Canadians, the, the biggest challenge is how to, uh, how to be changed by this process. Uh, there's a transformation invited of us. So how do we learn to, to walk the talk? The calls to action in some instances are very specific, and how do we uh, how do we find a new way of walking with Indigenous people? How do we take this, which we have learned because the residential school, the TRC process has really taken us to school, right? So how do we learn to uh, reach out to Indigenous people more and build stronger relationships? Uh, we're at the beginning of a a big learning curve. Secondly, I, th I think we need to learn to tell our history in a, in a different way and in a much more truthful way. Last summer I had an experience which, uh, which really brought this home to me. I was touring with uh, uh, a cultural anthropologist and I asked him, where is the oldest trace of human settlement in what is now Saskatchewan? And he indicated a, a site between the towns of Aneroid and Pontex. And, uh, it was disarming because that site is less than a half an hour from the farm where I grew up, and yet I knew nothing of it. And my telling of, of the history of that region really began with the arrival of my great-grandparents and my grandparents and their settling of the land. That, that's such a, a limited and restrictive, narrowing version of our history. So we need to tell our history in a new way, but that history needs to include and treat well the suffering of Indigenous people, the story of the Indian Act, uh, the story of residential schools, uh, the way in which the coming of European settlers, of immigrants, created profound challenges for Indigenous people and their way of life. Another challenge that the, the Catholic Church faces is how to hold together uh, a deep understanding that the residential school system was flawed, that there were tragic things that happened there, and that the, the larger, larger legacy uh, of the schools is, is really a difficult legacy, with the, the reality that there were lay people, women and men, religious and priests, who, who did serve there generously and offer themselves, and their sacrifices were, were genuine. And, and their care for the students was genuine. How do we hold those two together? The TRC final report also speaks of that and, and grapples with it and talks about how difficult reconciliation is when we listen faithfully to both, both those strands. We don't want to throw under the bus all of the people who served in those schools, but at the same time, we don't want to adopt a defensive posture and we want to hear deeply the pain and suffering of Indigenous people in order to, to respond. So that's a, that's a big challenge. The other area I would say uh, that we face here in Saskatoon and in, I'm sure in many other places is a challenge is how to walk with our Indigenous brothers and sisters who are Catholic and who want to hold on to something of their spiritual traditions at the same time 
live their lives as Catholics deeply. So how do we listen and learn to them to engage in a dialogue and to, to think through where it's appropriate in our, in our worship to include, uh, for instance, a, a smudge or praying in the four directions, uh, where to include elements of indigenous spirituality that are completely consistent with, with our Catholic faith and our Catholic worship. So there's a lot of discussion to be had there. Did you know Eastern Christian churches celebrate Easter several weeks after Western Christian churches? This year, the Western churches celebrated Easter on March 27th, but Eastern churches will celebrate on May 1st. This is because Western churches follow the Gregorian calendar, while Eastern churches follow the Julian calendar. Pope Francis and other Christian leaders are hoping to unify the date for Easter so all Christians celebrate on the same day around the world. Pope Francis is having a quiet week to recover from the Easter Tritium liturgies. Let's take a closer look at those. The liturgy started on Thursday with the Chrism Mass in the morning and the Mass of the Lord's Supper in the afternoon. The Pope celebrated the Mass of the Lord's Supper at a center for asylum seekers just north of Rome and he washed the feet of 12 men and women. Among those 12 were Christians, Muslims and Hindu believers. Come sacerdoti, noi ci identifichiamo con quel popolo scartato che il Signore salva e ci ricordiamo che ci sono moltitudini innumerevoli di persone povere, ignoranti, prigioniere che si trovano in quella situazione perché altri li opprimono. Ma ricordiamo anche che ognuno di noi sa in quale misura tante volte siamo ciechi, privi della bella luce della fede, non perché non abbiamo a portata di mano il Vangelo, ma per un eccesso di teologie complicate. Sentiamo che la nostra anima se ne va assetata di spiritualità, ma non per mancanza di acqua viva che beviamo solo a sorsi, ma per un eccesso di spiritualità frizzanti, di spiritualità light. Ci sentiamo anche prigionieri, non circondati come tanti popoli, di invalicabili mura di pietra o di recensioni di acciaio, ma da una mondanità virtuale che si apre e si chiude con un semplice clic. Siamo oppressi, ma non di minacce e spintoni come tanta povera gente, ma del fascino di mille proposte di consumo che non possiamo scrollarci di dosso per camminare, liberi sui sentieri che ci conducono all'amore dei nostri fratelli, al grece del Signore, alle pecorelle che attendono la voce dei loro pastori. Oggi, in questo momento, quando io farò lo stesso gesto di Gesù di lavare i piedi a voi, dodici, tutti noi stiamo facendo il gesto della fratellanza e tutti noi diciamo siamo diversi, siamo differenti, abbiamo differenti culture e religioni, ma siamo fratelli e vogliamo vivere in pace. Ognuno nella sua lingua religiosa 
preghi al Signore perché questa fratellanza si contagi nel mondo perché sempre ci sia la fratellanza e la bontà. The Good Friday liturgy is different from the rest, of course, because there's no Mass and the homily is actually delivered by the preacher of the papal household. Before the veneration of the cross, Father Raniero Cantala Mesa delivered the homily. He said, we all need to learn that the opposite of mercy is vengeance. Many people, he said, wrongly believe that justice is the opposite of mercy. According to Father Cantala Mesa, he also said that one of the areas in life where mercy is most needed is in marriages. Husbands and wives need to be merciful with each other, otherwise marriages risk falling apart over the slightest thing. Later that same day, the faithful of Rome gathered at the Colosseum for the traditional Stations of the Cross with the Pope. This year the meditations were written by Cardinal Gualtiero Bassetti of Perugia, he focused on the modern-day situations where humanity suffers. The stations ended with Pope Francis reading a lengthy and very moving prayer that he wrote himself titled, O Cross of Christ. While Pope Francis was taking part in the Stations of the Cross, the papal almoner was taking part in a different type of Via Crucis, the stations on Bishop Konrad Krzyzewski's Way of the Cross were the different places in the Vatican neighborhood where homeless people gather and sleep. At each stop, he would pass along a caress from the Pope, a handshake and greeting, as well as a sleeping bag. Unlike the stations that were being marked at the Colosseum, Bishop Krzyzewski's Way of the Cross had about 100 stations. Pope Francis then presided over the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday. As always, the vigil was spectacular, beginning in darkness with the faithful lighting their candles from the newly blessed Paschal candle and hearing the history of salvation. During his homily, Pope Francis said that we, like Peter and the women at the tomb, cannot discover life by being sad and bereft of hope. He emphasized let us not stay imprisoned within ourselves, but instead break open our sealed tombs to the Lord. Each of us knows what they are, so that he may enter and grant us life. Let us give him the stones of our rancor and the boulders of our past, those heavy burdens of our weaknesses and falls. Now after that homily, 12 adults were baptized and confirmed. And on Easter morning, Pope Francis once again presided over Mass, this time outside in the square. This Mass does not include a homily, because right after, the Pope gives his blessing to the city and the world, or the Urbi et Orbi blessing. Now, before giving that blessing, Pope Francis spoke again about the need for mercy, this time remembering all the places where people suffer and calling for a peaceful end to the conflicts and tensions in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Libya, Ukraine, the Central African Republic, and South Sudan. He also remembered the victims of violence in Brussels, Turkey, Nigeria, the Ivory Coast, and many other places hit by terrorism. He remembered every conflict and every terrorist attack that has happened recently even those that mainstream media have forgotten. It was a bit of a quiet week, but let's take a look at what else Pope Francis did. On Monday, he led the Regina Celli. Now remember, in Europe, Easter Monday is still a holiday, hence the Regina Celli. He said the resurrection marked the life of Jesus' apostles. Once they realized that Christ was risen, they felt the need once again to follow him and announce what they have seen and experienced. 
After leading the prayer, Pope Francis mentioned the attack that took place in Lahore, Pakistan on Easter Sunday. And he said, homicidal violence and hatred lead only to pain and destruction. On Wednesday, of course, was a general audience and Catholic News Service has details. L'unica cosa di cui abbiamo davvero bisogno nella nostra vita è quella di essere perdonati, liberati dal male e dalle sue conseguenze di morte. Purtroppo la vita ci fa sperimentare tante volte queste situazioni e anzitutto in esse dobbiamo confidare nella misericordia. Dio è più grande del nostro peccato. Non dimentichiamo questo. Dio è più grande del nostro peccato. Oh Padre, io non oso dire, ne ho fatto tante grosse, tante, Dio è più grande di tutti i peccati che noi possiamo fare. Dio è più grande del nostro peccato. Lo diciamo insieme, tutti. Dio, tutti insieme. Dio è più grande del nostro peccato. Un'altra volta. Dio è più grande del nostro peccato. Un'altra volta, Dio è più grande del nostro peccato. Over the weekend, Pope Francis is scheduled to lead a prayer vigil and celebrate Mass for the Feast of Divine Mercy. And let's take a look now at the resignations and nominations that happened over the last week. Pope Francis has appointed a new head of the Vatican's pension fund. His name is Nico Savelli and he is a professor at the Catholic University of Milan's Faculty of Science of Banking, Finance and Insurance. There have been some changes in various Vatican diplomatic postings. Archbishop Michael Banach moves from being nuncio in Papua New Guinea to being apostolic nuncio in Senegal. Monsignor Francisco Escalane Molina goes from being a nuncio to a counselor to being the nuncio to the Republic of Congo. So that's a big move. And Monsignor Paul Fitzpatrick also moves up from nuncio to a counselor to being the Apostolic Nuncio in Turkey and Turkmenistan. And in a move that surprised many people, Pope Francis named Bishop Bernard Hebda the new Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis. Now, why is this so surprising? Well, because since September 2013, Bishop Hebda has been the coadjutor bishop of Newark, New Jersey. Basically, a coadjutor assists the current bishop until he retires, and then he takes over and leads the diocese. So Bishop Hebda was actually supposed to take over the diocese of Newark when the archbishop there retires, and that's expected in about a year. Then last June, Bishop Hebda was appointed administrator of St. Paul in Minneapolis when Archbishop John Nienstead and Auxiliary Bishop Lee Pichet resigned as the result of lawsuits against the diocese. Archbishop-elect Hebda will be installed in St. Paul, Minnesota on May 13th. Well, that's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time for more of what's happening behind Vatican walls. As always, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or check our blog for updates or watch us on Roku TV On Demand. From everyone here, thank you for watching and see you next time.